We have a number of questions this morning. I'll read the questions in English and then translate them to the best of my ability into Thai. Is it possible to practice anapanasati without first understanding dependent origination and the five khandas? I think wisdom is developed from meditation, not from books. I do not like to read books and listen to Dhamma talks. I don't understand. Maybe it is better for me to stop practicing anapanasati. If you ask the question that way, then we will respond with another question. If that's how you feel, then why bother practicing anapanasati? If that's how you feel, why are you wasting your time practicing anapanasati? If one is practicing anapanasati, one ought to know why one is practicing it. If we speak about wisdom, we have to have some understanding of what wisdom is. Otherwise, we don't really know what we're doing. We don't really, we're not really meditating. The reason we practice anapanasati is in order to have a life free of dukkha, a life that is free of all problems. We study but teach a samupada or dependent origination because it helps us to understand in the beginning what dukkha is, what our problems are, and how they happen. This is just for a start. It's not the end. But the more we understand what our problem is, the more we will understand how to meditate in order to solve the problem. So there's the understanding about what our problems are, what dukkha is, and there's the way of practice for dealing with those problems and eliminating dukkha. And so these two go together. To put it a little more briefly, dependent origination helps us to understand ourselves, to understand our own lives. And then it shows us what we need to do in order to solve the problem of our lives. But at this point, we're still unable to solve that problem. And so, for, so we must also practice anapanasati until we have the ability to solve the problem. So we could say that understanding dependent origination is like our map that shows us where to go, where to walk. And then anapanasati is walking according to the directions of the map. The two must go together. You can't have one without the other. <clears throat> Your answers were okay, but let's ask Ajahn Buddhadasa about what love is. There are two kinds of love. One kind of love is to love without understanding, to love ignorantly, without knowing why one loves. The other kind of love is to love with mindfulness and wisdom, to, to understand deeply what it is to love and why one loves. The first kind of love happens naturally, instinctually, and it's necessary that we 
pass through and experience this ordinary kind of love so that we understand what it's good for, what its difficulties are, how to love properly, and so on. It's necessary that we learn <clears throat> through this instinctual love a number of things. This kind of love is necessary for reproduction. It's through this ordinary kind of love that the species um, carry, continues itself. Now this ordinary kind of love can also help us to solve social problems. With this kind of love, if it's developed on a somewhat higher level, it can enable us to solve social problems so that we can live um, with each other in peace. And then love can be developed higher and higher until it's a kind of love which is beyond love, a love which is beyond the power of positive and negative. This is the kind of love which is free. The ordinary love is not free. It's under the power of love. One is, one is still under the power of love and so there is no real freedom. But the other kind of love is free. It's beyond the power of love. Both kinds of love happen naturally according to the law of itapajayata, the law of conditionality, which means that both kinds of love arise through causes and conditions. One should understand both kinds of love, not just one. <clears throat> In short, love is something which we must conquer. We should not let love defeat us, but we should be able to conquer it so that love does not have any power over our hearts or minds. <clears throat> okay, here we have a series of questions. We'll see how they go. <clears throat> you have spoken at length about using the law of nature to explain and justify Buddhist philosophy and practices. Yet even within this impermanence that highlights the law of nature, virtually all living beings are giving individual and or collective mechanisms for violent self-defense when attacked. How does this aspect of the law of nature relate to Buddhist anapanasati and human self-defense needs. As we said earlier, the law of nature that is dependent origination helps us to know ourselves, to our, know ourselves and know that what the problem of dukkha is. <clears throat> and then it shows us what we must do to end dukkha. It shows us how dukkha ends. But still we can't reach this end of dukkha. And so we must practice anapanasati. Anapanasati is the way to develop ourselves so that we can reach the end of dukkha. When we have reached this end of dukkha, then our problems are finished. There's no more problems left to worry about. And then we have received the best thing that human beings can get from life. So in short, the law of itapajayata conditionality or dependent origination, paticca samupata, shows us what's wrong and what to do about it. And then anapanasati 
is the way to do what needs to be done until we are successful. Because our minds, because our lives are under the power of positiveness and negativeness, we're always spinning around and acting according to this power of positiveness and negativeness. And so there is, there is no real freedom in our lives. And this is dukkha. This lack of freedom always being at the beck and call of positive and negative is dukkha. Dependent origination helps us to understand this and then shows us the way to get free to liberate ourselves from this bondage to the positive and the negative. And then we practice anapanasati in order to get free. So in short, what this is about is conquering the positive and the negative, conquering all problems instead of letting them conquer us and enslave us. Under Bhatichya Samupada is like the map and Anapanasati is like the traveling. To travel you need a map, but a map without traveling is meaningless. So these go together. The map and the traveling are inseparable. Because there are problems in life, we must solve them. But to solve them with violence just increases the dukkha. To have a problem in the first place is dukkha. And to solve it through violence just makes more dukkha. So we should learn to solve our problems without violence then we will not add to the dukkha of having problems. Now you should understand that problems are of two kinds. There are material problems and mental or spiritual problems. For example, the animals have their material problems such as finding food. And they should Try to, they must solve these problems to the best of their abilities. But human beings have another kind of problem, which is deeper, more subtle, and profound. This is a problem in the mind, a problem of understanding. Now, neither of these kinds of problems should be solved with violence. If we solve both external and inner problems violently, we just create more trouble. So we should solve them with a way that is more subtle, refined, so that we don't create more dukkha. We should never use violence to solve problems. The question was, what do you do when personally faced with murder, rape, robbery, etc.? He himself has not been personally faced with murder and rape, so I ask the question in more general terms. This, once again, problems are of two kinds. There is the more self, uh, more superficial, shallow kind of problem, which is external. And then there's the more subtle, profound problem, which is internal. That someone would try to kill us or rape us or something is of the first kind, the more superficial, shallow, material kind of problem. We should find the kind of knowledge and skills which will prevent such things happening to us. If we are intelligent, we will live in a correct way so that these things, 
thieves will not encounter us. But even so, even if they do happen to us, then we will find an appropriate way so that they are no danger to us. If we have mindfulness and wisdom, if we are mindful and intelligent, then we can find the kind of knowledge and skill necessary to prevent these external problems from being of any real danger to us. But then there is the, the inner the problem, the more refined and subtle one. When we speak of the inner problem, then we can say that we are being murdered all the time. We are being constantly murdered and we are being raped violently all the time. These, the criminals, the criminals which are murdering us and raping us all the time are the defilements, greed, anger, and, and ignorance, stupidity. These defilements are murdering us and raping us all the time. This is the problem which is truly important. This is the problem that we need to solve. As far as the material external problems, these are not so difficult to solve. They can be dealt with using ordinary worldly knowledge, which is quite easy to find if one looks. That's not a serious problem. The serious problem is this spiritual murder and rape, which is going on constantly in each of us. This is what we must protect against. Once someone has achieved enlightenment, what do they usually do with the rest of their life? I guess it wouldn't be their life, it would be the body's life. This question is the same as asking, what does the arahant who has ended all dukkha, who has put out all the fires of greed, anger and delusion, what does the arahant do with life? The answer to this can be, is quite simple. We can base it on the, the records of Buddhist history. Certain, arahant, certain of the arahants, after conquering the defilements, then spend their lives traveling around, sharing the Dhamma with people, teaching and spreading the Dhamma in order to help other people make an end of the defilements. Other Arahants didn't go around teaching, but they lived a quiet life of peace and happiness. Although they didn't teach, much or at all, their, just their way of living, their peace, the peace and happiness of a life free of defilements was an example to others. And so although they may not open their mouths, when other people would see them, just seeing them and their happiness would encourage other people to get interested in Dhamma and living and practicing in order to have that peace and happiness. And then some arahants would even get somewhat, would help somewhat with social problems to the degree that it's appropriate for an arahant to help with social problems and also to the degree it's possible to help. They would help 
they would use their understanding of Dhamma to help address the problems of society. So it's not really a problem to ask what what does an enlightened being do with their life? It's quite simple. One one helps people. And there are these three ways to choose from. One is to wander spreading the Dhamma, carrying out the Buddha's wish so that people can be free of the defilements and dukkha. The second is to live a quiet, simple life of peace and happiness as an example to, to others. And third, within the, to the degree that it is proper for a bhikkhu or monk or nun, one helps to solve the problems of society. But the genuine wish or intention of the Buddha was to work together to help to, for everyone to help each other to conquer the defilements so that there can be genuine peace in this world. The genuine intention, the true intention of the Buddha is to, to dedicate one's life to bringing genuine peace into the world. Next question. One may accept that one is not self and only a combination of the five khandas. But the same fact then also concerns other people. But it is natural that you are more interested in the five khandas in your own body than in someone else's. Is it really logical to get rid of a self by the five khandas? It is by the explanation of the five khandas. It is not for me. The five khandas is a way to understand oneself. To understand oneself on the physical, mental, and spiritual levels. Through understanding the five khandas, we can understand all three of these levels and how they interact or are integrated. Further, in understanding the five khandas, we understand that these khandas are codependently originated. They happen according to the law of itapajayata, of conditionality. They're all conditioned according to the law of conditionality, which means that they can't be controlled by us, that is, by the mind. We or the mind can't control these khandas to make them how we want them to be. Therefore, all of the khandas are not self because they're, they're not controllable by anything or anyone. Understanding not self then one no longer needs to attach to any of the khandas or any of life as self. And then there is no more dukkha. So we use the understanding of not-self to solve the problems of the life which is not-self. Life has always been anatta or not-self. But not knowing this, we create problems for life. And so we use the understanding of the five khandas to understand that life is not self. So that this life, this selfless life, 
no longer needs any problems. So this is what the five khandhas are for. If we investigate it wisely, it's not just something we believe, but it's something so that we can remove all dukkha from life. If one continues to live according to atta or self, if one hangs on to self, then life will go astray and get lost. And there will be even more dukkha, more problems than we started with. Life isn't perfect when it begins. And through self, we make it even worse. But through understanding anatta, we can free it of all problems. We are able to use the, the biological or evolutionary principle of the fittest survive, the fittest survive. We can use this here. We can use this principle in order to improve and develop the five khandhas so that they are truly fit, so they are most fit which means they are appropriate, ready, proper, and fit for living in this world without dukkha. When the khandhas are the most fit, then there is survival. So we can, we can use the understanding of the five khandhas in order to be the most fit and then we will survive. In your last talk, you said that desire creates the desirer. If there is not right mindfulness, question, does this mean that there is already attachment or is ta attachment a later development. The question isn't so clear, but I'll translate it, see what happens. You can see this for yourself quite easily. When there is hunger, then there is the hungry one, the one who hungers. Which comes first, the hunger or the one who is hungry? If you watch carefully, instead of just thinking about it, but observe, you'll see. The desire happens, and then the desire which one comes first you can ought to be able to see for yourself. But what matters is to not let any of these problems happen, to not let the problem of hunger and the hungry one, desire and the desirer to happen in the first place. To use the most profound mindfulness, intelligence, and wisdom so that these problems don't happen to begin with. And then there is no hunger and no one who is hungry. There is no desire and no desirer. And so there is no dukkha, there is no problem. We, we live without any problems, without any dukkha. In short, what this means is to use mindfulness and wisdom to prevent the defilements from happening. If we prevent the defilements, there's no desire and there's no hunger. And so what's the problem? The real question is here, here is, are we able to sublimate or transform the hunger? 
can we transform this hunger into a matter of wisdom? Can we transform it into the hunger for wisdom, the hunger to understand? If we can sublimate or transform desire and hunger into the direction of understanding the truth, then the problem will end itself. There won't be any more dukkha, there won't be any more desire or hunger. Hunger bites its owner, but mindfulness and wisdom doesn't bite its owner. So we should transform all hunger into a matter of mindfulness and wisdom so that it won't bite us anymore. And then our life doesn't have any more problems. If we hold on to something, or if you want to call it attachment, but it hasn't reached the level of attachment to self, then it's not a problem. But when we use the word attachment, we're always speaking of attachment to self, or what is called in the Pali, atawa dupadana, the upadana or attachment that makes us say me, mine, self. The kind of attachment that leads to us talking about self, to the concepts of self. Once there is attachment to self, then there is the problem. Then dukkha is full scale and complete. Before there, if there's no attachment to self, there isn't really dukkha, but still there are the natural difficulties and hassles of, of life, of the Vedana and how to respond to things and so on. But the essential thing is to have the wisdom to prevent this attachment to self because that's where it really becomes a problem and dukkha. So our task is to, to live without this attachment to self. Another way we can speak of this is how can life live with things that are not self? How can life live with things that are not self? If we understand this, then we won't have any trouble with life. To take life as being self is instinctual. It's a kind of instinctual understanding that we see life as being self. Even though it's instinctual, it leads to the problems that we have been talking about. So we must learn to transform this instinctual understanding into wisdom, into genuine intelligence. If we can transform or even sublimate the instinct of self so that it leads to the developed wisdom of not-self, then we can bring about a reconciliation between the instincts and wisdom. They need not be in conflict. But we can take that instinct, instinct of self and for self-preservation and develop that so it's no longer just instinctual, but it's what we call a 
developed knowledge so that there's we achieve the highest benefit for oneself which is to be free of all dukkha which we can which only happens through seeing that this self is not self it's not really self so if we can sublimate it or transform it in this way we we won't have any any problems with this instinctual kind of understanding it's like the instincts have a self in order to attach to it so we must improve or develop the instincts so they don't need a self to attach to until there's no self for the instincts to attach to in this way the instincts can be developed or transformed into wisdom so that we don't have any more trouble with life the what we thought was self is seen to be not self and then there's nothing to attach to and not attaching to anything there are no difficulties or hassles in life for instance enlightened people are said to keep staying alive because of their commitment to help others to overcome suffering would this be an example of selfless attachment or otherwise what keeps the commitment from fading away the arahant or you the so-called enlightened being who has transcended all self doesn't have any self to attach to for the arahant there is no self to attach to and so the arahant has no dukkha has no problem empty or void of self the arahant is full of wisdom but this doesn't erase or annihilate kindness friendliness and compassion just because there is no self doesn't mean that there is no compassion and so when seeing the people still suffer because of attaching to self the arahant will do what can be done to help them to to have a self which is no longer attached to as self the arahant will help others to see for themselves that there's nothing worth attaching to self until those people have no more self to attach to and are themselves free of dukkha so the arahant in being void of self and free of all trouble is full of wisdom if there is still attachment <clears throat> one cannot really love another if there is still attachment that any love will be selfish if one still has self then love will be tainted by this self and selfishness and one will always be trying to use love for one's personal benefit this is unavoidable but when there is no more attachment when one is free of self then love is pure and love will not be used or twisted by ego or by selfishness 
So there are these two very different kinds of love. The love where there is self, where there is attachment, which will always be selfish. It cannot be avoided. And then there is the love which is pure, which involves no attachment and no self. So to really love someone, to really love, to really help, one must be free of attachment and self. If one is still attaching, how can one help others to not attach? If one is still attaching, then our help will always be mixed up with our own personal benefit and advantage. But when one has gotten free of all self, then one can truly help because there is pure love. Be very careful not to mix up genuine love with selfish love, the love of attachment. This question is very long, which means it's hard to translate. So I may summarize it a bit. By means of anapanasati, while walking among the coconut trees, and by regarding my physical body, I have had a strong direct experience of the impermanence and changeability of all things in the world. During this experience, I was aware that the body was not my body. The experience was not mine. Just as surely I was aware of a self that was the vehicle of the experience. By this I mean I was having the experience. The self was the same self that usually inhabits the body that's not my body with the same memories and same personal identity. My question is this, although I understand not mine, I am confused by not self. So far in this course, the distinction between not me and not mine has not really been made. They're generally mentioned at the same time. Is it usual to experience one without the other? At first, we are still stupid. There is a great deal of ignorance or avicca. And so life is full of self, nothing but attachment, self, selfishness, and dukkha. But then we learn from that attachment and that dukkha and we become more intelligent until we reach a level that is, is we've seen the hassles and troubles of a life full of self. We've seen the dukkha of all that attachment. And then we reach the level that can be called the self of wisdom. At first, there is just the self of ignorance or the stupid self. Then we come to a level of where there is the wisdom to lead to live life correctly. And this can be called the wise self. And then through living correctly further and further, we come to the stage where one sees that nothing is worth clinging to as self. There's nothing worth taking or to be self or regarding as self. This can be the called the level of the self which is not self. So if we go through, we repeat this again. At first there's the totally ignorant self the self that is full of dukkha because of attaching to everything. Then there is the self which is half-wise, 
it has the wisdom to start living correctly in order to really develop. But there is still this feeling, this sense of being self. But then in, in the end, there is the self which is not self. If we still want to call it a self, we need to be clear that it is not really self. It is really not self. And this is the, the you could say, the self of perfect wisdom. The self which is not self. So there's the self that's full of dukkha and ignorance, the self that's half-wise and doesn't suffer so much, and then there's the self which is not self, the self of pure wisdom and no dukkha. <clears throat> or to put it even more simply, at first there was the self which was totally self, 100% self. And then later we only had half a self. And then no self at all. And when there's no self at all, we don't have to ask questions like this. Then same person asks further, can you explain your own experience of not me? Or is it an inference you have deduced from your experience of not mine? After we have practiced anapanasati well enough, we have the experience that all things are impermanent, have the inherent quality of dukkha and are not self. We see that every time there is the experience or feeling of self that dukkha bites us. Seeing this, we live carefully, mindfully, not giving any opportunity for this feeling or experience of self to happen so that it can't bite us. But even if sometimes we are, we slip, are a little careless or make a mistake, we're still smarter than we were before. And so there is less, less dukkha to bite this self which is not self. Whenever we are careless and think or experience self, then life bites. Then life is changed into the, a situation of biting and life bites its owner. So. Remember the different symptoms of life biting its owner that we mentioned earlier. Sometimes love bites. Sometimes anger bites. Sometimes hatred bites. Sometimes fear bites. Sometimes worry bites. Sometimes um, worrying about the future or longing after the past bites, jealousy bites, envy bites, possessiveness bites. When we don't, when some negative experience happens, we, we don't want it to happen, we want to, get, want to get rid of it. And that aversion bites. Positive experience happens, we want it, we desire it, and that wanting and desire bites. If we understand this, then there is a technique, there's a principle and a technique or a method to not let the self arise 
when we make contact with positive and ne negative experiences. And then these positive and negative experiences don't bite and life doesn't bite its owner. There's a way to do this if we are careful. I've read that the mind in meditation goes from a state of beta wavelengths to alpha wavelengths. In this state, the subconscious mind becomes more dominant. Does Anapanasati explore the subconscious mind in any way? Um, the first part of the question I cannot translate properly, but it really is irrelevant to the the question at the end, so I'll just translate the question. If we have practiced anapanasati correctly, deeply, and successfully until reaching the level where we are well-versed or expert in anapanasati, then the understanding that has been developed through this um, expert practice of anapanasati will remain as merely subconscious understanding or experience so that whenever a situation arises in life that understanding or that has come from the practice of anapanasati will be available for dealing with the problem. Okay, um, I've tried to keep answer, asking the question because our usual Western fascination with the subconscious doesn't interest Tanajan in the theoretical way that Western psychologists like to talk about it. Instead, he replies like this, when we, you should know that the subconscious has two aspects, the wholesome and the unwholesome, or the beneficial and the harmful. This, one can experience how the subconscious can help us and harm us. Through really practicing anapanasati, then one will have the deep experience of impermanence, of dukkhaness and not self. And this understanding will then be subconscious so that whatever we meet in life, we will know it as impermanence, having, being inherently dukkha, and not self. In this way, the subconscious, this subconscious understanding or experience will be solely beneficial. And all the harmful, unwholesome aspects of the subconsciousness will be calmed away. They will disappear. So there will remain only a subconscious which is able to understand impermanence, dukkhaness, and not self. And so it will be a beneficial subconscious. So his reply is solely in practical terms rather than talking about a theoretical concept. The unwholesome or harmful aspect of the subconscious, every time it activates or functions, will do something harmful or dangerous to life. It leads to life experiencing dukkha and stress and all kinds of problems. But the, that aspect of the subconscious which is correct which is wholesome and beneficial leads to dealing with life correctly and brings about a perfection of everything we need in life. Not what we desire, but what we, we need. 
this correct or beneficial aspect of the subconscious is called parami parami which means that which leads to perfection they're often translated as perfections but they mean that which brings perfection the unwholesome harmful aspect of the subconscious is called the anutsaya or the defiled tendencies you can call it a collection of evil and harmfulness a collection of harmfulness the other is a collection of that which is useful and healthy and beneficial if we understand the subconscious in this way it will make it easier for our study and practice there is the parami aspect which leads to perfection of what we need and the defiled collection of unwholesome tendencies which just helps to make more problems ordinary people have a subconscious which is just these undefiled tendencies or these defiled tendencies i asked if he meant this 100% that ordinary people have subconsciousness says which are 100% the anutsaya and he said well if they're 100% ordinary then they have 100% defiled ten anutsaya subconsciousness if they're totally worldly then that's all their subconscious will be they're always ready to love get angry hate fear be envy jealous worry even in their dreams why do people who understand dukkha or dukkata and dukkha and atta and dependent origination know that they should apply themselves and know they should apply themselves to the four noble truth and to the old eightfold or tenfold path and yet they don't in other words how does one explain the human tendency of irrationality in terms of dukkha and dependent origination it's like they've got a map they've got the best map in the world but they refuse to travel they refuse to walk according to the map why this is so is they don't know this is hard to explain it seems that there is still bait in the world which is tricking them there's all kind of bait that keeps them attached to the world wanting to have fun wanting to be entertained wanting to be loved wanting to own things wanting pleasure the deliciousness the pleasure the loveliness the creativity the excitement of the world is a kind of bait which keeps them stuck in the world and so they have no interest in walking according to the map but once they see how this bait just makes them stupid and keeps them wallowing in dukkha then they begin to practice anapanasati and if they practice seriously and correctly they can overcome the alluring qualities of all that bait all they know is the name of dukkha they know the name of dukkha they can say the word the sound but they don't know dukkha itself they don't really know the reality of dukkha and so they don't despise and fear dukkha and if they don't despise and fear dukkha they're not going to put any effort into practice in order to get free of dukkha 
But once one knows dukkha itself, the reality of dukkha, then one will despise it. One will be disgusted by it. And one will be t terribly afraid of it. And then one will practice very seriously to get free of dukkha. Once you really hate it and fear it, you won't mess around and play any more games with it. You need to recognize that dukkha comes in both forms. There are the positive forms of dukkha and the negative forms of dukkha. You probably only pay much attention to the negative kinds of dukkha. It's easy to hate and fear the negative forms of dukkha. But most people don't give any attention to the positive forms. People are still infatuated with things. They still want to have fun with things, with the positive forms of dukkha. They're even, they even volunteer. People are totally willing to experience the dukkha of positive things because they're so infatuated and obsessed with these things. The primary example of this is sex. Sex is such, is so very positive for people. And so they're very willing to experience the dukkha of sex because of this positiveness. But once we see that even in the positiveness there is dukkha, there is entrapment, there is slavery, there is stupidity, then one begins to despise and fear even the positive kinds of dukkha. And then one can begin to get free of those things. And so and no longer be infatuated and obsessed with them. So remember that there's not just the negative dukkha like physical pain or illness or not getting what you want and so on, but there's the positive dukkha of being obsessed with good health, with the dukkha of getting what you want and the dukkha of sex. When a fish is caught on a hook, it knows that the hook is painful. It knows the dukkha of being caught on the hook. But we're not as intelligent as the fish. This hook that we're caught on, we're dangling and wiggling from this hook, but we think it's fun. We think it's entertaining, exciting, beautiful, wonderful. And so we don't hate or fear the hook. In fact, we seek it out and we pay lots of money to get hooked. The fish isn't like that. It knows that the hook is dukkha. It hates and fears the hook. But we're not like that. We have no hate or fear for the hook. And so we continue to diggle, dangle and wiggle from the hook. So last of all, thank you. Um, time is up for this morning. We'd like to thank you for coming here with your interest in Dhamma and to which gives this place value. So in Mok is only a value, and our life is only a value here when people come to study and investigate the Dhamma. So we thank you for making this place and our life worthwhile. That's all for this morning. <laughs>